All right, episode 100, Starscream. Time to get to work. Let's see what TF Wiki's got on this guy. Holy fuck. Are you familiar with the reality TV show Survivor? Well, for the benefit of those who aren't, Survivor is a competition wherein a bunch of contestants are left to live in a remote place, usually a beach, and have to learn to live together with little to no supplies to start things off. Of course, the competition aspect comes wherein they have to vote a contestant off every few days until two or three are left. And at that point, the finalists have to convince a jury of their peers, i.e. the previously kicked out contestants, to vote for them as the ultimate survivor and winner of a million dollars. Granted, there is a lot more to the show other than just the votes. The contestants battle in numerous competitions and challenges to win advantages to help them, well, advance. And of course, alliances or voting blocks are formed between contestants to take others out. At its core, it is a fascinating social experiment seeing different personality types from different ways of life interact with, and at many times, scheme against each other. And in the end, it takes a specific and specially skilled type of individual to be able to outwit, outplay, and outlast everyone else. It goes without saying that I am a huge fan of the show as I've faithfully watched every single season, now on its 47th, ever since it started well over 20 years ago. Anyway, the reason I bring up Survivor is because in many ways, when it comes to the world of Transformers, Starscream in whatever iteration strikes me as the ultimate survivor. Whether it's by lying, cheating, stealing, or schmoozing, the Decepticon Air Commander always seems to find a way to get himself ahead of everyone else, or at the very least, stay alive. So to start, Starscream was part of the very first wave of Transformer toys released in 1984, most of which were plucked out and repackaged from the Japanese toy line Diaclone, wherein Starscream was known as Jet Robo. Fighter type, as opposed to Thundercracker who had the designation of Acrobat type, and when brought over to the US in order to bolster the bad guy's numbers, a third jet, Skywarp, was added as well. But back to Starscream, who was originally slated to be named Ulk-Tar. No, seriously, fortunately Bob Budiansky eventually changed his name to Pretty Poison, and then the Silver Snake, before finally and thankfully settling on Starscream. Although Silver Snake does sound pretty cool. But aside from thankfully coming up with the name Starscream, Mr. Budiansky also established pretty early on on what Starscream's most defining character traits would be. Ruthless, cold-blooded, and overly ambitious. A Decepticon who looked only to overthrow Megatron and claim the mantle of leader for himself. And he makes his intentions pretty clear a little over five minutes into the very first episode of the Transformers cartoon, wherein his very first spoken lines ever right to Megatron's face were, The Autobots would have lost eons ago if I'd been calling the shots. And then quickly followed up with a bold proclamation that, My time will come, Megatron. From this quick exchange, one is instantly led to believe either one of two things, that this dude has one hell of a set of big balls, or just plain stupid. Either way you fell though, there was no denying that he made quite the first impression, especially since he was voiced by the late and great voice actor and comedian Christopher Collins, better known as Chris Lara, who at this point was already known for being the voice behind another iconic G.I. Joe character, Gung Ho. Oh, and of course the main bad guy himself, Cobra Commander. Anyway, despite his very well-known traitorous intentions, there was no confusion with regards to his place in the Decepticon pecking order as leader of his fellow Seeker brothers, Thundercracker and Skywarp, and more importantly, second-in-command to Megatron, which gave him the distinct honor of being the wielder of his leader's rather controversial alt mode. Talk about an odd dynamic. But while I guess you could chalk it up to Megatron keeping his enemies close by, I would think that the big reason why Megatron tolerated Starscream was that he was basically worth more to him alive. As for all his faults, Starscream was an accomplished and deadly warrior. 
Throughout the first two seasons of the cartoon, Starscream was a constant thorn in the Autobots and Megatron's side. Aside from inadvertently and unknowingly bringing the deactivated Optimus Prime and thus the rest of the Autobots back to life, when he stubbornly disobeyed Megatron and shot at the mountain where they were buried under, Starscream is also best known for being a key figure in introducing two iconic Transformer characters into the mythos. The Autobot Air Guardian Skyfire and the... Brutish? Combiner Bruticus. Okay, so if you want to be technical about it, that makes it about seven characters. So as the story goes, well, well, well before the war in Cybertron, Starscream was actually an explorer along with Skyfire, and it was during one of their many expeditions that they came upon a prehistoric planet called Earth. Unfortunately, both explorers were caught up in a storm and Skyfire was lost. Fast forward millions of years later, and the Decepticons discover Skyfire doing his best Captain America impression, encased in ice, and revive him. And Megatron convinces Skyfire to join the Decepticon cause against the evil Autobots. Of course, true to his character, Starscream pulls his old friend aside and shares his dream of ultimately taking down Megs and offers the position of second in command to Skyfire. Anyway, as you can guess, the Decepticon ruse doesn't last long and Skyfire, old friend or not, finally joins the Autobots. Eventually, Starscream's endless attempts leads him to being kicked out of the Decepticons and dumped into some remote island where he has to outwit, outplay, and outlast. <laughs> nah, just kidding. It was on this island that he built his new brigade of soldiers, the Combaticons who had the ability to combine into the giant Bruticus, out of the numerous World War II vehicle wrecks scattered all over the island. So with his giant in tow, Starscream comes so close to finally defeating Megatron until his plans are foiled once again by Megatron's other combiner, Menasaur, who takes out Bruticus with an awesome flying blow to the head. But you know the saying that every dog has its day, right? Well, Starscream definitely has his day in the 1986 movie, wherein he finally achieves his dream of gaining leadership of the Decepticons after discarding a beaten and battered but still functioning Megatron into space after a humiliating defeat to the Autobots in the Battle of Autobot City. Unfortunately for Screamer, his coronation is cut short by the reformatted Megatron, now Galvatron, who wastes no time in rendering Starscream into a smoking pile of ash. And that would have been all she wrote for Starscream except that his toy was still being sold in stores after the movie. So we managed to return in the post-movie third season of the show as a ghost. It's worth noting that his grave in the Decepticon crypts is humorously marked by an incomplete statue of just his legs. Oh, that wacky Galvatron. Anyway, once risen, Starscream's ghost enters into a deal with the disembodied head of Unicron. A body for a body. Starscream proceeds to possess the Decepticon Cyclonus, Scourge, and Trypticon in an effort to gather the components needed to resurrect the Planet Eater. And while Starscream ultimately tricks Unicron into granting him a body before he fulfills his part of the deal, the Autobots manage to detonate both Unicron's head and the newly resurrected solid Starscream back into space straight into the path of Galvatron, who once again proceeds to blast Starscream anew, sending him tumbling uncontrollably all the way up to 1997's Beast Wars universe, where he returns once again as a ghost, this time to possess a poor Waspinator. Anyway, it's at this point that it is revealed that Starscream is in possession of a mutated spark that essentially cannot die which explains why he is able to return time and time again. And return he did as Starscream or a version of himself who would basically be included in pretty much every iteration of Transformers that followed either on the small or big screen. Two of my favorite incarnations of Starscream would be in Transformers Animated in 2007 and the series that followed Transformers Prime in 2010. In the former series, Starscream starts things off in the usual Starscream fashion by betraying Megatron and momentarily seizing control of the Decepticons. Unfortunately for him, Megatron returns and, well, kills him. That is, until he is revived by a shard of the Allspark that gets embedded into his forehead, thus making him, surprise, surprise, immortal. And what makes this version of Starscream truly unique is that his fellow traditional Seeker brothers are reimagined as clones constructed by Starscream with each one taking on an aspect of his personality. We got the complete egotist, the coward, 
the greedy one, the liar, jealous one, the bootlicker, and, well, that was left unexplored. In Transformers Prime, Starscream initially starts out as your typical scheming second-in-command to Megatron, but eventually gets in line after Megatron inexplicably decides to save him from a murderous Dreadwing, and instead gets obsessed with keeping his place next to Megatron when it is challenged with the entrance of Shockwave later on in the show. It's worth noting as well that this Starscream is more of an all-business kind of dude as he quickly dispatches the captive cliff jumper by jamming his clawed hand straight into the poor Autobot's chest, killing him instantly in the very first part of the first episode. Just to set the more serious stage and setting of the Prime show, whose overall tone was heavily influenced by the live-action movies that were out at around the same time. And of course, it's no surprise that Starscream, or at least a version of him, was part of that universe as well. Now, I won't go too much into the do I or do I not like the whole Bayverse aesthetic, but right from the start, with the release of the very first concept art picks online, Starscream's live-action design was quite the controversial one, looking like a cross between a long-armed gorilla and a Dorito with chicken legs. But to be fair, once he was seen in the first trailer in full rendered glory and in motion, flying and transforming in mid-flight, I thought he looked fine. Quite a departure for sure, but what can I say? I got used to it. But the bigger crime in my opinion was not what Starscream looked like, but what they did with him in the movies, which was essentially nothing. While his special relationship with Megatron was kinda hinted at, he was more of a subservient flunky, with no traitorous tendencies ever coming to light. And aside from a few cool action scenes here and there, that was it. As he was unceremoniously killed off in the third movie with the Autobots' ally Sam jamming an explosive in his eye. Anyway, much like the Bayverse movie, Starscream surprisingly isn't much of a big deal in the original Marvel comics as well, at least initially. After being one of the bad guys doing, well, very bad things in the first few issues, Starscream and many other Wave 1 Decepticons are destroyed by the Autobot Omega Supreme and are basically kept in storage within the Autobot base, until he is eventually rescued and revived by Ratbat, which ultimately wins the then-current Decepticon leader Starscream's undying gratitude and unwavering loyalty. Oh, who are we kidding? Starscream bides his time and eventually double-crosses the Bat by harnessing the power of an ancient artifact called the Underbase for himself, and with said power, proceeds to clean house and eliminate Air Raid, Fireflight, Skydive, Slingshot, Silverbolt, Hound, Blue Streak, Mirage, Hoist, Brawn, Gears, Goldbug, Jazz, Snaptrap, Nautilator, Overbite, Sea Wing, Scalar, Tentacle, Jetfire, Blaster, Searchlight, Freeway, Chase, Roll Bar, Wide Load, Thundercracker, Skywarp, Slag, Swoop, Snarl, Sludge. Phew, sorry, this is quite the kill list. And I think we could all use a breather. How about spending this quick break by helping me out with leaving a like or a comment? Or if you still haven't, a sub. Or better yet, why not try out being a friend of the toy shelf for even more exclusive goodies? All you gotta do is just click the join button on my channel's homepage. But either way, your support is very much appreciated, so thank you. So where were we? Alright. <sighs> Razorclaw, Rampage, Headstrong, Dive Bomb, Tantrum, Grimlock, Octane, Astrotrain, Blitzwing, Buzzsaw, Laserbeak, Strafe, Scattershot, Lightspeed, Nosecone, Afterburner, Hunger, Ripper Snapper, Blot, Sinner Twin, Cutthroat, Soundwave, and... Omega Supreme. Ah, revenge is sweet. Anyway, the carnage finally stops when the empowered Starscream attempts to take in the full power of the Underbase, and well, you know how that goes. He goes... Pop! And that spells the end of that Starscream. Until a new toy is made, leading to his resurrection as a pretender, that is. But we're so not done with the comics. Not by a long shot. Next up is a Dreamweave series of the early 2000s. Granted, I rarely touch upon this run, given nothing major really happened story-wise for many Transformer characters, most likely due to the publisher's quite abrupt and controversial end. Starscream, though, is the rare exception. In the very early episodes of the G1 cartoon, a number of nameless, alternately colored Seekers were used as enemy filler. And one of those extras was eventually officially released in Japan as an e-hobby exclusive with the unique name of Sunstorm. 
Anyway, Dreamwave took this obscure Sunstorm character and to their credit, reinvented him into a deranged clone of Starscream created by who else but Shockwave, who had equipped within his body a solar-powered fusion reactor. And yes, it is as dangerous as it sounds. So as the story goes, Sunstorm escapes Shockwave's lab and seeks out his brother in order to recruit him for his holy mission from the Transformers Oracle. No need to get into specifics, he was just batch crazy. And of course, delighted with being reunited with his long lost brother, Starscream gladly joins him with open arms. Seriously, do you not know who we are talking about? Starscream ends up riddling Sunstorm with holes and kicks him down a chasm. In the end, however, true to his nature, Starscream leaves it to his old friend Jetfire to take out the increasingly unstable Sunstorm, who goes out in a blaze of glory high above the Earth's atmosphere, killing both himself and poor Jetfire. But as entertaining as that little story was, my favorite treatment of Starscream would have to be the one in the IDW comics. But before I get into that, here's a quick disclaimer. IDW's story is told over a period from 2005 to 2018 and over hundreds of issues. And if I go through Starscream's story in detail, this episode will go on for hours. So I will be doing my best to cover the key points of his arc and leave it at that. So let's get started. Back in Cybertron, before the Great War, unsurprisingly, the deceitful and opportunistic Starscream was a street hustler, running scams for his personal gain. He even went as far as going into the political realm wherein he embezzled funds from his constituents. It's at this point wherein he meets his fellow Seeker brothers, Thundercracker and Skywarp, whom he convinces to reformat their bodies to be identical with him in a call of solidarity. In reality though, he did it to confuse the taxpayers who were pursuing him. Anyway, Starscream is one of the earlier recruits of the Gladiator Megatron into his rising Decepticon faction, and he does so out of pure respect for Megatron and complete belief in his cause. It would only be a few cycles later when that respect would slowly turn into fear at seeing Megatron more as a source of instability and a path to destruction, which basically sets Starscream off into his classic pattern of constantly plotting against Megatron. It is Starscream's desire to overthrow Megatron that initially brings him to Earth, which he discovers through undisclosed means is a source of a rich, powerful form of Energon called Ore 13, seeded there by Shockwave millions of years prior. You know that wacky scientist was up to no good for a long, long time, but more on that later on. So Starscream leads the initial Decepticon infiltration team on Earth to secretly mine the Ore 13. Unfortunately for him, Megatron eventually discovers Starscream's treachery, arrives on Earth, and easily defeats an Or 13 powered Starscream. Next up is possibly one of my favorite Transformers story arcs ever, All Hail Megatron, wherein the Decepticons pretty much defeat the Autobots with the help of a traitor within their ranks. And how does that happen? Well, it basically takes one traitor to sniff out another. Starscream manages to convince a mentally unstable Sunseeker to betray the Autobots, which would simultaneously lead to an assassination plot on Megatron. And while the whole betrayal part works with the defeated Autobots exiled back to a dead Cybertron, leaving the Earth to the Decepticons' mercy, Megatron manages to survive. And amidst the Decepticon destruction, he and Starscream have a pretty substantial discussion wherein Megatron acknowledges that Starscream's time as leader will come. But when it does, it will not be because it was given to him, but because he earns it by defeating Megatron. But until that day comes, his place is next to Megatron to ensure the victory for the Decepticons. A timely discussion as it is interrupted by the triumphant return of the Autobots. So with a renewed commitment to the cause, Starscream hails Megatron and leads the charge against the Autobots. And even at the end of the battle with a gravely damaged Megatron laying at his feet, Starscream surprisingly takes his fallen leader into his own arms and carries him away to safety as he leads the Decepticons in a retreat. Ironically, with Megatron out for an extended period, Starscream does assume the mantle of Decepticon leader, to rather disastrous results as he basically inherits a defeated faction who fall into even more desperate circumstances, even resorting to cannibalizing each other to survive. And when a revived Megatron returns, he is disgusted and enraged at Starscream for letting his Decepticons fall so far. 
but at this point, unable to effectively rule through respect or by fear, Starscream himself is just too defeated in spirit to care, and despite being repeatedly pummeled by Megatron, begs for him to just put him out of his misery. But Megatron refuses. He explains that it's not a case of him fearing losing the leadership of the Decepticons, but of Starscream gaining it. And it is Starscream's very existence and presence in the Decepticon ranks that serves as a constant reminder to him to always watch his back. Ouch. So Starscream lives once again. Anyway, more time passes and eventually, the Great War finally comes to an end with Megatron and the Decepticons defeated. And with the Autobots struggling to establish a new status quo of government in Cybertron, Starscream manages to weasel his way into a seat of power and influence alongside the Autobot leader, Bumblebee. I'll leave how that happened for you to read about. And a new player on the scene who represents a growing third faction of non-aligned Cybertronians collectively referred to as Nails, Metalhawk. Over time, Metalhawk develops a close and lasting friendship with Starscream. Until he is killed by Screamer, of course, who blames his death on the warmongering Autobots and Decepticons, whom he literally kicks out of Icon City to seize full power over Cybertron for himself. Oh, and at some point, a cave is discovered where a fallen titan, think a really, really, really huge and ancient transformer, is found, who mysteriously reactivates and anoints Starscream as the Chosen One in front of a great number of Cybertronians present, further cementing Starscream in the eyes of many as the true ruler of Cybertron. In actuality, Remember Shockwave and all that long game shenanigans he was doing? Well, at some point, the crazy scientist time travels back to ancient Cybertron and under a new guise of Onyx Prime, instructs said Titan to give Starscream the title of the Chosen One in the present day, in the hopes that under his rule, Cybertron society will go to shit, allowing Shockwave free reign to do whatever he pleases in all the confusion. Anyway, despite Shockwave's maximum effort, in fairness, Starscream manages to do a pretty decent job as the self-proclaimed High Chancellor of the refulgent Cybertronian Dynasty, Emperor Perpetua and Defender of the Realm. As it turned out, Cybertron society didn't turn to shit under Starscream's rule as he managed to fight off numerous Decepticon insurgencies led by Megatron and an attack on Icon City by a Necro-Titan. Think really, really, really huge and ancient Transformer. Zombie. In fact, along with his new frenemy, Windblade, Starscream manages to find other lost Cybertronian colonies and with them form the Council of Worlds. And somewhere along the way, despite all the games of deceit he played to get to where he was, Starscream develops a genuine desire to be a great leader and see Cybertron flourish under his rule. Thanks in part, of course, to the ghost of Bumblebee, who died at some point as well and serves as Starscream's growing conscience. He even went as far as to confess all his crimes, thus leading to his imprisonment and eventual return as the leader of the Decepticons, because at this point, Megatron was an Autobot. But that's beside the point. In the end, when things got real with the arrival of Unicron, Starscream ultimately and willingly sacrifices his own life in the final battle against the Planet Eater. Now how is that for a full story arc? But you know what they say, as one story ends, another one begins, and in this case, we have the new Transformers series by Skybound Comics. Since this is pretty recent, I just want to lead off with a quick spoiler warning in case you do have plans of checking this out, which I do highly recommend. But moving forward, the story starts in a familiar place at the crash site of the Ark discovered by two familiar humans, Spike and Carly, buried under a mountain. Jetfire arrives and revives his old friend, Starscream, who then proceeds to execute an already deactivated Bumblebee, and with that, all hell breaks loose. Now I know that Starscream has been portrayed many times as a jerk, but in this series, well, it doesn't pull back any punches. He's a straight up maniacal a-hole. He literally squashes a parachuting pilot in midair like a mosquito. Fortunately, his co-pilot narrowly manages to escape. He kicks Ravage into the air in front of Soundwave and straight up cannibalizes an injured Skywarp for spare parts. 
But Karma's a bitch, and this Starscream gets his comeuppance pretty fairly early on as he is taken down by Soundwave of all bots. I mean, you gotta be the worst of the worst if the coolest and chillest of Decepticons, Soundwave, best known for his unwavering loyalty, can't stand you enough to finally get rid of you himself. Maybe he should have been nicer to Ravage. But like I said, it's still pretty early into the series, so there's plenty of time for this Starscream to get back into the game at some point down the line. Now I know that this episode is already quite long as it is, but I can't finish without going over some of my favorite Starscream toys in my collection. While my ultimate favorite Decepticon is Thundercracker, the fact that Starscream is essentially joined at the hip with this guy toy origin-wise as the two original Diclone Jet Robos, my love for the Seeker design has carried over to Starscream and Skywarp as well, and I have made it a point to get as many definitive versions of these three as I can get my hands on, and more often than not, it all starts with the main Seeker himself, Starscream. Unfortunately, I never did get the original vintage Starscream. My first ever Starscream toy would be the classic Starscream released in 2006, quickly followed up by the Voyager movie version of Starscream in 2007. Ultimately, I ended up getting more G1 accurate decos of both, and while there have been arguably better and improved versions released since, these initial two will always have a special nostalgic pull for me. Anyway, it's on the masterpiece front where I got even more obsessed with having the ultimate version of Starscream. When it comes to the Bayverse, I opted for the knockoff version of the movie masterpiece Starscream. Aside from the more friendly price, I do believe it has better QC and slight improvements over the official one. And I got myself the DNA upgrade kit to give him more articulation in the arms, but truthfully, it was more so that I could get Frenzy to round up my 2007 Decepticons. But in the end, it's really getting the perfect classic Generation 1 Starscream that really matters. So Starscream was the third Masterpiece Transformer to be released in 2006 by Takara. At the time, I still wasn't what you would call a hardcore collector, but the moment that this was announced, there was no doubt in my mind that I would get it. It wasn't a big deal for me that it didn't quite look like the classic Starscream as famed Japanese mecha designer Shoji Kawamori wanted to focus on a more accurate F-15 Eagle alt mode which resulted in a notably tweaked robot design with Starscream's tail fin structures repositioned from his legs to his hips with the intent of creating the feel of a samurai wearing a pair of swords at his waist. It also didn't bother me that Starscream's traditional grayish-white base color was replaced with a more real-world darker gray and it didn't matter that MP03 was released here in the middle of a raging storm in the city. I got off work early and headed straight for the store to get my Starscream. And when I got home, there was a blackout. But that didn't stop me as I opened up my first masterpiece Starscream by candlelight. How romantic, don't you think? Since then, of course, there have been a series of more accurate masterpiece Starscreams, but in the end, I settled on the Crimson Wings by the third-party company Deformation Space. Sure, there was Starscream version 3 or MP52. I know, officially it's referred to as version 2, but I think that MP07 was enough of a departure from MP03 to deserve its own unique version. Gosh, so many numbers. Anyway, I really wasn't feeling MP52 aside from the rather prohibitive price. I thought that he looked too cartoony and the proportions felt kinda off to me, but most of all, I just found him small. I guess you could argue based on whatever size chart that it was accurate, but for me the Seekers were bigger, and so I opted for deformation space instead. I think it's the perfect level of tune without looking too comical, and the size is just right. And I don't know if this is a hot take, but I love the engineering. While many people like to complain about it being a pain to transform, I have no issues. I admit that there is a slight learning curve, but as long as you know what to do, it's fun, and getting to the end result whether jet or robot is so satisfying. Anyway, love him or hate him, there is no denying the importance of Starscream in the entirety of the Transformers franchise. Yes, Starscream basically started out as the cliché archetype of the lying and conniving traitor, but he's transcended that and THE Starscream has actually become the name for the character type as defined in TV tropes, referring to a traitorous minion of another villain who's secretly plotting some way to betray their boss. I'd say that that's quite the accomplishment coming from a dude who was originally going to be called Ulktar. 
For this 100th story, I really wanted to cover a real special character, so I put it to you, my viewers, to decide. I set up two polls with characters from two of my most popular subjects, Transformers and G.I. Joe. For the Transformers, Megatron easily came out on top with Starscream a distant second, which I guess made sense. But for the final round, I pit my top two Transformers against the top two Joes, Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes. And given how badly Megatron beat out Starscream, I thought that this last one was more of a formality. I was already mentally preparing myself on giving the story 100 to old Megs. But Starscream pulled out the upset of the century. True to his nature, he came out from behind and soundly beat everyone else, including Megs. And it wasn't even close. I have to admit that it was a pleasant surprise to see how everything went. True to his character, it doesn't matter how many times Megatron beats Starscream down, deservedly or not, he will just keep coming back for more. Whether it's through a tiny shard of the AllSpark, or an indestructible mutated spark, or just his sheer cleverness, cunningness, and well admittedly at times, deceitfulness, Starscream has the uncanny ability to adapt and turn any situation he finds himself in to his advantage and flourish, which makes him in my book, the ultimate survivor. And rightfully so, one of the greatest Transformer characters of all time. And speaking of the greatest Transformers movies of all time, as much as I love the 86 movie, nostalgia and awesome 80s soundtrack aside, my vote goes to the recently released Transformers 1. If you want my non-spoilery take on this amazing movie, you can check it out here. Or if you want other Transformers stories, take your pick over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.